Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great, great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. It's been, it's, it's great to be back and to be able to, to talk to you today. So yeah, so it's, it's, as I say, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, to, I'm going to talk to you about this. It's, um, despite what the title says, I think you've probably come to realise as we go through that I'm probably saying more about the dairy foods than I am about the meat, but I'm trying to, trying to give a bit of a balance, if you like, between the, between the two. It's, I think, important that we, that we now sort of recognise, um, I mean, we probably already have always recognised different key life stages, but I think in terms of risk of, of particular disease outcomes, these are probably more important than perhaps we realise, you know, not that far away. So I'm going to just pick out some of the things. Let me just make an admission before we start. Most of the evidence that I'm going to show, particularly in relation to the sort of teenage years, um, are based on UK data, not anywhere else. But hopefully there's some, there's some read across, which will, which will be of interest. So that's <coughs> what we're going to do. We're going to start from here and end up roughly here in 40 minutes or so. And uh, it's, it goes very quickly. Uh, and talk about the role of the role or the risks associated with these foods. So we'll start with children. Now, obviously, I'm going to deal with specific issues. There's not time to do look at all of the issues, but just one or two things about children. I mean, one of the things that we are uh, suffering, if that's the right word, in the <coughs> UK, is this onslaught really over the last 10, 15, 20 years of childhood obesity. Now, you can see, particularly in the sort of uh, pre-teens age group. Um, more in boys than in girls, but both are, you know, both are um, either overweight or, or high proportion overweight or, or obese. And what's kind of interesting, but probably not that surprising, I suppose, is the fact that um, the, this, the, the most obese in this age group actually are in the most deprived sections of the population. And you can think of the, perhaps why that is. Um, I haven't got the slide to show you today, but last year there was a, quite a big study done by UNICEF with FAO looking at food security or food insecurity, if you like, and um, they assessed food insecurity in, in um, children, and what, what I think was absolutely astounding is that the UK came out top of all EU countries in terms of the percentage of children under 15 that were in food, that were in severe food insecure families. Now that's really, really, I think, well, it's more than worrying. And, and I, you know, you can argue about how the data were gathered, but nevertheless, it's, we, we, were, we were top. And top doesn't mean good, obviously. So, you know, in, in the light of that, we're not, we're not going to review this, but um, this review on childhood obesity and in relation to dairy products was published about three or four weeks ago. Um, it just so happens that the first author was one of my PhD students um, some years ago, a really talented Greek uh, student now working in France. But anyway, you know, they, they did a critical review of the role of milk and dairy products in, in the development of childhood obesity and in adolescence as well. And I say there's not time to go through in detail, but the conclusion was, you know, what we, I guess, what might have thought. Little evidence to support concern of uh, a limit, uh, needing, needing a limit to food and dairy product consumption in order to uh, promote, um, in order, because of the fact they may promote obesity. Um, you know, there have been other studies which have kind of shown similar thing, but it's nice to, to bring it all together in, in, this, in this review. Well, one of the things that some of us have been worrying about um, has been the, the rise of these milk alternatives for a variety of reasons. And one of the questions that I've been kind of putting to students is to see whether they're paying attention, you know, is whether the protein quality in these products is adequate for children. And of course, it's a trick question because if you look closely at the label, they're virtually completely devoid of protein. And that, you know, is a worry. And there have been, there have been, a, there have been a number of cases um, that have been reported where children, young children, have been weaned onto almond, particularly. I don't know why, um, and have developed the sort of classical signs of protein deficiency. You know that you would see in developing countries years ago, and some of them have been really, really serious. I think there was one child in the Netherlands that died, and, you know, it, it, 
it shouldn't happen because you know the information is there there's virtually no protein in them and I suspect what protein is there is not of particularly high quality anyway and so it's a worry um, and these are just one or two reports this is a slightly different report excess of um, this is actually almond milk products which apparently contain quite a lot of oxalate so there's quite a lot of um, issues around this in, in children um, and a French, a French report where, where what is really what I was saying before severe nutrition deficiency in young infants and this was almond um, milk as well and I think there was a case in France actually where the, the parents of the, of the child I don't know whether there was one in this report or not but they tried to take the, um, the almond milk almond product manufacturer to court to say it was their fault that their children had become ill uh, I don't think they actually won the case because I think uh, you know, it was shown that it was on the, on the label that there was none there anyway Anyway, so you know, this is, these, are just, these are just worries and uh, I think it's just a question really predominantly of, of education. People need to know, you know that these are not complete replacements for milk um, and particularly not for children. It's probably okay for adults in small amounts. The other issue of course that we have across much of Europe, this is a report led by Kevin, uh, Kevin Cashman from Cork, um, we, we have a sort of Consi fairly consistent uh, suboptimal vitamin D status, even in southern Europe, where you would think there would be more, probably more okay because of the, the higher sunshine levels and so forth. And um, as you may know, in the UK, we've now got, uh, an, uh, we've now got a, a, a dietary guideline for consumption of vitamin D, <coughs> whereas before it was always assumed that we were quite adequate in vitamin D because of sunshine exposure. So now there is a reference nutrient intake of 10 micrograms of vitamin D per day. And that's supposed to be for everybody, children, adults, elderly. Um, <clears throat> most people never get anywhere near that. I think the last data I've seen from the National Diet Nutrition Survey, the average intake of vitamin D, dietary intake, was about 2 micrograms per day. I think that was pretty good. So we have an issue. And I have to admit that you know, we have an issue as well, as a result, primarily as a result of that. It's not the only reason, but it's the predominant reason. Childhood rickets disappeared from the sort of medical records, I think in about 19, early 1940s in the UK. Um, there had been an introduction of um, some oil, I think, that the government used to use. And then there was also um, some, some other, I think, me measures taken. But anyway, it is now back. And we had about, there was a, the most recent data I've seen, there's about 800 cases of childhood rickets. I think it was in 2016, <coughs> actually, the last set of data I've seen from the NHS data statistics. Now, these tend to be, I have to say, these tend to be children in specific sections of the population that are more prone to this issue than, than other parts of the population. But I think we need to ask ourselves, you know, should we be seeing childhood rickets in, 2000, in, in the 21st century? I, I don't think we should, and I, and I think it's it's. I always feel slightly shameful to show these because it, it shouldn't be happening, and it's it's it, it is, tends to be predominantly a vitamin D issue in, in these children, not entirely, but predominantly. And as I say, it tends to be in ethnic groups that are more, that are probably less efficient at synthesising vitamin D because of dark skins and and other dietary issues as well. So that is a worry. And you know we've already seen. Uh, no, this is. Uh, obviously, one of the major supermarkets, Asda, have been sort of experimenting, if you like, with fortification of milk with vitamin D. It's not compulsory, of course, like it is in parts of North America and in other places. Uh, I think the general feeling is it probably should be, uh, or there should be, you know, there should be some means of ensuring that the sort of background intake of, of vitamin D is, in, is increased. So we move quickly on into um, teenage years and into, and into I'm not. I'm not advocating that pregnancy should be in the teenage years, <laughs> but we'll get there through the teenage years, if you like. And <coughs> this is, uh, again, from the National Diet Nutrition Survey. It's not all the most recent data, I have to say, but it's, the, it's fairly recent. This is the years one to four of the, of the, eight, of the now eight-year period. I've actually added on years five to eight for ID and for a particular purpose. But these pillars represent the percentage of these three populations that consume less than the lower RNI. In other words, the 
the requirement, if you like, for the bottom 2.5% of the population that, um, that only require that amount. So you can see we have major issues. We have you know, nearly 50% of, of young females in this. So nearly all, uh, the problem is really with young females. Um, nearly 50% that have less than the lower RNI for iron and um, not as much for cal but calcium, magnesium, uh, iodine, and of course iodine and calcium are particular milk issues. You can see that on average we get 40% of dietary intake of calcium from dairy and nearly 40% of, of iodine. It's much higher than that in, 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 in children. Children is about, it's about 70 odd percent of iodine from, from milk. So we have, you know, potentially big issues here, and the, the main reason that we see, that particularly the, the calcium and the iodine, obviously not the, not, the, not the iron, the iron is to some degree a reduction in red meat consumption issue, um, but these other ones are predominantly a, a dairy, reduction in dairy issue. And you can see why we get that. These are the, um, again, these are NDNS data, but we've gone in and and sorted it out by much smaller age groups than NDNS itself does. And you can see that what happens, this is in young females. You can see in, in the 11 to 18 year age group, massive drop from earlier childhood, if you like. And then a very slow increase uh, as, as, you, as, the, as they get older. And it's really not till quite old when you nearly get back to where you were as a child. So that's, that's, that is the issue, and it's mostly milk. You can see there has been a reduction in, in yogurt a bit. Um, cheese has not changed very much, but it's predominantly milk. And, and I think we don't really know, well, I, I know we don't really know. We don't really know why that occurs. We don't really know why teenage females in particular, it, it drops in, in, in uh, males as well, but not by as much. Why is it that they do this? There's something that apparently is not terribly... Uh, acceptable or not very cool to drink milk or to consume milk in that age group. And it's to do with things like skin colour and texture, all sorts of things like that, which may or may not be true, but that's some of the things that we hear people talking about. And I'm uh, sorry, I was just going to say you should, you should look at that in, in relation to this is the background reduction in, in milk consumption on the population as a whole for the last sort of 20 odd years. And the worry is in relation to bone development. What I think people, people often talk about the importance of peak bone mass. Peak bone mass used to be always said to be about age 30. It tends to be a bit younger than that now, actually. Um, but it's really, yeah, it's not showing up on here, but it's really, you can see in this age group between 10 to 20, where most of the, 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 most of the bone mass is actually developed. Mineralization, the rate of mineralization and the development of, of mineral mass is vastly greater in that period than, than later on. And the thing is, if you don't get it right in that period, then you increase the risk of bone, uh, bone fractures in later life, and particularly for women in the, in the postmenopausal period, you know, when they get, suffer from the, the estrogen, estrogen withdrawal. You see this little skeleton here is thinking about magnesium because you, you saw on the earlier slide that magnesium actually was had a lower overall intake in that age group than calcium. And whilst magnesium is not entirely a milk issue, it milk does provide a bit. But the point of putting it there is there are two or three studies now which suggest that magnesium actually might be more limiting for the development of bone mass than calcium. I don't think anybody quite knows whether that's really true or whether it's, uh, or whether it's you know, one of those things that you can't quite explain. But if, if it is true, then we are worrying even more because magnesium is a much bigger intake of magnesium. The suboptimal intake of magnesium is greater than for calcium. So that's, that is a worry. The iodine issue, I guess you've heard a lot about in, in recent times. Um, a lot of the work on iodine has been done by Sarah Bath and Margaret Raymond at the University of Surrey, as you probably know. Sarah really started it off in her PhD some years ago. And um, this review that they did on, on um, iodine status uh, of young pregnant women, UK pregnant women, uh, summarizes really all the data that they had at the time. And, and it really demonstrated that suboptimal iodine status was pretty prevalent in young pregnant women. It's really, really important in the first three months of pregnancy, particularly. 
And, of course, since then, there have been now four studies, and these are all, of course, observational studies. You've got to interpret them in that way. But they're all telling us more or less the same thing. The, the UK LSPAC study, um, which Sarah and Margaret actually used to, to look at this, they'd, they assessed the... Um, Basically, a number of cognitive issues, uh, IQ and reading skills, children in nine-year-old, eight to nine-year-old, and found that those the children that were from mothers that were suboptimal in iodine status during pregnancy, early pregnancy particularly, they had poorer, lower IQ and reading skills than, than from the contemporary um, children that were from um, iodine sufficient mothers. And you can see the study in Spain, the Netherlands and Australia <coughs> more or less telling us the same thing. The, the outcomes are slightly different that they've measured. Language skills, executive functioning, which covers a number of things, of course, um, psychomotor and mental development. So, you know, the, the, the evidence, I think, on iodine insufficiency and the, the, the risks associated with iodine insufficiency is increasing. And it's certainly something that in the UK, the medical world is taking much more... Um, paying much more attention to than I think they did just a few years ago. Of course, it, it has raised a number of questions uh, in relation to, to milk, because milk, as you, as you know, is the biggest single source of iodine. So we've had all sorts of questions. Um, Margaret and I, actually, Margaret Raymond and I actually were asked by the Food Standards Agency to, to go along and see them and talk to them about this. And could we find any evidence that, that iodine in milk nowadays was actually lower than it was, say, five, ten years ago? And we couldn't. We, we couldn't see any real, you know, there's quite a lot of survey data. It didn't suggest it was really very different. But of course, what, what we've subsequently shown is that certain types of milk, usually the, the way the milk's produced, has quite a big effect on iodine content. And the biggest difference was between organic milk and conventional milk. And Sarah Bath had shown that, actually, in her early work in, with summer milk. Winter milk has always had a higher iodine content than summer milk. And so we looked at winter milk, and we've, this is, we published this just earlier this year, which is, this is actually done in two parts of the UK, about four main supermarkets, um, six months. So we've got from summer into winter, we've got conventional UHT and organic milk. And you can see that all of them increase as you go from summer to winter, but as you can see, the organic is always uh, consistently lower than conventional milk, particularly in the summer. So you would expect the difference between the two to be greater in the summer, I think. UHT milk is a bit of a mystery. In the first study we did, UHT milk was, was looking very like organic. In this study, it's sort of sitting between conventional and organic. And I've tried to get all... I've tried to talk to a lot of the people involved in milk processing, you know, that understand what happens when, you, when UHT processing occurs. And the, the only sort of thing that they've said is it's probably the heat or the high temperature. Well, it might be, but where does the iodine go to, you know? It's a bit of a mystery. So anyway, um, and I, I honestly don't think that's really a worry. I think the worry is that if, if women, in, particularly in early pregnancy, want to consume organic milk for whatever reason, then as long as they know they need to drink more of it, then that's really all they need to know to get the same iodine intake. But nevertheless, it has, this has caused a lot of excitement particularly in the organic world. You know, they weren't happy about this. But it's, it's true. A lot of work in Norway, actually, which I haven't time to mention, uh, except that milk iodine in Norway has gone down. They've got good evidence of it going down over the last five to ten years. And they've ascribed that to increased use of rapeseed products in the diet of the cow. And, in fact, have good experimental data to show that... Um, milk from cows that have been fed these rapeseed products has lower iodine content. And it's, it, it's something to do with the metabolites from the glucosinolates, I think, which inhibits uptake of the um, iodine by the thyroid. And it also, the same system, actually, uh, is the transporter from iodine into the mammary gland. So that's, um, that's, that's the reason that they think it's happened. I'm not sure, to be honest, it's the full answer, but um, it, they're quite worried about this in, in Norway. So moving on into middle age, and, I, and I'm going to say something about meat, <coughs> please to know. But I wanted to start with, with dairy because this is where we've done most of the work. These are um, actually uh, one, 
two new, relatively recent meta-analyses. The top three are our own from Reading. Um, the other three are from, um, from um, the Netherlands, from Wageningen. In fact, we have a, an author with us from Wageningen in that group. But anyway, these are meta-analyses of um, the, the association between milk and dairy and consumption and these various outcomes, the main ones, obviously we're interested in cardiovascular diseases, including, particularly including stroke, uh, and also type 2 diabetes. And really, I'm sure you've seen all this before, the relative risk in the higher consumers in no case is great, significantly greater than one. And you can see in some cases it's significantly lower than one. And the ones that really jump out are the association between milk and stroke. And we've seen this before. We've seen this consistent low relative risk in high milk consumers for risk of stroke. Um, and it's come through again in this study. Um, and what's really interesting too is the association between yogurt consumption and reduced risk of type 2 diabetes. And I think that probably needs, you know, given the high prevalence we've got of type 2 diabetes, we have 700 new cases every day in the UK of type 2 diabetes. That needs a bit more explana explanation. And it's something to do with fermentation. We were talking about this at lunch actually, but it wasn't of milk. But, um, the, the fermentation issue seems to be a feature of it. So, you know, that's pretty good, overall pretty good evidence that there's no increased risk overall of either any of these outcomes with high consumption. And you've probably been aware of the PURE study, which was published about, again, about a month ago. And this is really quite, uh, this was really quite a massive undertaking, you know. This was done in 21 countries, five continents. Um, you can see there were nearly 140,000 individuals involved in it. And again, we haven't time to go through it in detail, but what you can see is that the conclusion was that um, berry consumption was associated with low risk of mortality and major cardiovascular disease events in this diverse multinational cohort. And the, it was really quite remarkable how consistent the, the outcomes, or the results were across the different countries. Um, you, know, you know, there was different, there was contrasting countries, some quite relatively low consumers compared to relatively high consumers. Wide age range as well. So that's, you know, that's again pretty, pretty good, I think. Evidence. But of course everybody asks, you know, what about saturated fats? Because milk and dairy products are generally, for many people, the biggest single source of, of saturated fats. Why is it then we don't see this increase in <coughs> cardiovascular disease risk? And it's a long story, but um, you're probably aware of some of the stories, some of the issues. Um, there's now two studies similar to this, actually, which have shown um, <coughs> hazard ratios essentially the same as relative risk. Mathematically, it's not quite the same, but it's essentially the same interpretation. So this is the uh, association between the risk of cardiovascular disease with intake of saturated fats, saturated fatty acids per day. And you see the, when meat was the source, the, the, the risk increases. When dairy is the source, it tends to decrease. There's also issues of matrix, and we've been, these are Emma's data. <laughs> and I, I show this because there have, there have now been, I can't remember how many studies we've counted up, but there's been quite a lot of studies on this, comparing predominantly the effect of cheese versus butter, I have to say. Almost all of those studies have been done in the University of Copenhagen, and almost all of them are comparing cheese of a Danish origin with butter of a Danish origin. Um, and they've all been relatively consistent in showing what Emma showed here, but I think Emma, Emma's study was much more complicated in many ways because she tried to devise a sort of matrix response, if that's the right word. In, in other words, she had cheese, and then cheese plus butter, butter plus calcium caseinate and calcium carbonate. So equalise fat, equalise calcium, equalise protein. And you can see what she found was that um, over the course of the uh, six-week parallel study, you can see that what happened was that in terms of total cholesterol and LDL, that the cheese consistently produced substantial reductions. The other two were slightly downward too, but not as much as cheese. And the one I think was really interesting was this, this 
student D, as she, as she called it, where for a period of six, was I think was it six weeks? Yeah, a period of six weeks, the subjects were banned from consuming any cheese, <coughs> completely banned. And you can see what happened at the end of that six weeks. Their total in LDL actually increased. And when they were allowed to consume cheese, it began to fall. So there's obviously <laughs> something unusual about that, in, I think. I don't know whether Emma can explain it, but it's, it's, and I guess it depends where the base, what the baseline is as well, because these are just changes from baseline. Um, but nevertheless, it illustrates the point that if you compare cheese with butter, no matter how you do it, you do it with butter, you get a different response in terms of blood lipids, even though you're providing the same amount of fat, same amount of saturated fat. And this is fairly consistent with the, the Danish studies. And we can, we can, if you want, we can discuss why that might be. The other thing I just wanted to mention, this is one of our own studies published a few years ago now, where we've seen, not, not necessarily in every study, but we've, in a number of studies, we've seen that milk proteins actually have a, a reducing effect on blood lipids as well. And in this study, you can see the whey protein is, has a significant reduction in total cholesterol and also in triglycerides. Uh, the uh, Casein is in the same direction, not significantly different from each other. And whereas the control, which is a carbohydrate, actually tends to increase blood lipids. And that's also, I think, you know, one of the, if you like, one of the maybe counterbalancing effects of, of the fat. Uh, and also, of course, we see consistent effects of milk proteins on blood pressure. This is, again, the same study I showed you a minute ago, where we see a reduction in uh, peripheral systolic pressure with the whey protein and also systolic central pressure, which is in some ways more, more um, important than per peripheral pressure. And that may well give us the link, if you like, to stroke, because high blood pressure is probably the biggest single risk factor for stroke. Again, this is the same study where we've looked at the um, effect on endothelial function using the FMD technique, which you're probably familiar with. And again, we show an improvement in endothelial health in simple terms, from the whey protein, casein didn't do anything, and again, the control was worse, if you like. So there are, there are issues around dairy products, and perhaps you could argue about the proteins particularly, that have functionality uh, and may explain you know, some of the reasons why we don't see increased risk in terms of um, saturated fat consumption, for, in for instance. I thought I would just show you this. It's, it's actually just published again a few weeks ago from the Sun study, and this is just highlighting essentially an interaction of age on the association between um, risk and red meat consumption. And it's maybe not surprising because the risk of most things actually increases as you get older. But anyway, you can see that the risk um, of this is actually of all-cause mortality uh, increases uh, with age according to meat consumption, red meat consumption. I think one of the things I just wanted to highlight in relation to meat was the emerging evidence of an association between particularly red meat and particularly processed red meat consumption and the risk of type 2 diabetes. This is a number, this is a meta-analysis a few years ago now, um, but you know, still good data, which um, basically shows overall for total meat there was no overall significant effect on type 2 diabetes risk. And I assume, and I couldn't find it actually when I went back to look in the, uh, yesterday when I wanted to refresh memory about it, I think this probably includes white meat as well. Um, but you can see that there was a slightly increased risk uh, according with, for red meat and a bigger increased risk for processed meat. And thus, processed meat is a problem in the sense that it is a very, very variable commodity and differs also between different countries, you know, compare American data with UK data. But it is emerging processed meat as, as being not the most desirable, I have to say. This was um, another study uh, published last year, which basically shows the same thing. What they're describing is a non-linear dose-response relationship between um, daily intakes and type 2 diabetes risk. You see red meat um, tends to be a relatively linear, to me, response, but processed meat isn't. And the, the thing you can just see if you look at the 
the same intakes, you can see the risk associated with high with the processed meat is about nearly twice that for the unprocessed red meat. And, the, and just you know, in the same study, they demonstrated what you've seen before: reduction in risk associated with whole grain consumption, and an increased risk <coughs> in relation to sugar, <coughs> sugar sweet and beverage consumption. Unfortunately, the colours haven't come out brilliantly on here, but this is, this is our own stuff, which isn't published yet, I have to say, but it is based on NDNS data. We've gone back to the raw data and teased out various things. Um, this is actually an adult man, and all I wanted to highlight was that the processed red meat is associated with an increased plasma glucose in a sort of linear fashion. Red meat, it's red meat, which is the ones on the left, look as though they're going down, and they probably are if, if there were more data, but it wasn't quite significant. The trend wasn't quite significant. What we thought was interesting, it's cross-sectional data, of course, and that, all with all the weaknesses associated with that, but it is kind of supportive of, of other stuff that's, that's emerging on, on processed meat. Of course, meat and processed meat particularly has um, had a lot of publicity in relation to uh, colorectal cancer particularly. This is, I have to say, not the most recent World Cancer Research Fund data, but it's consistent with what the, what the more recent data is. Uh, and I've, you know, I've chosen colorectal cancer because it is significantly more, it, it, is the, it is the cancer site that is the greatest for both sexes, if you like. It's not sex specific and it's, it's the greatest prevalence of a cancer site for both, for both. So you can see that overall the, um, the risk of colorectal cancer in relation to dairy products is negative. In other words, dairy products seem to provide some protective effect um, for colorectal cancer. And it, the, I think the evidence is beginning to suggest that it's, it may be calcium mediated. On the other hand, red meat and particularly processed meat, are associated with an increased risk. And you can, it looks at first glance that the increased risk for red meat and processed meat are more or less the same, but in fact they're not because of the, the red meat is per 100 grams per day, the processed meat is 50 grams per day. So the risk associated with processed meat is about twice that, if you like, of red meat. And that's you know, pretty consistent with the more recent data that they've, they've brought out because they do, they do up regular updates when new data becomes available. And more or less finally, I just wanted to say a little bit about um, the possible role of dairy protein in diets of the elderly. And you know, most of the data that you'll see in a minute are people in, in studies that have been people in their 80s and in some cases are older than that. The problem, one of the problems there is that as we age, and it starts, you know, it says 50 on there, it starts actually before then. Most of the evidence, I think, starts, the gradual loss of skeletal muscle mass starts at the age of about 40, worryingly for many. Um, but of course, you can, re you can alter the rate at which you lose it by, particularly by exercise and by other things. Uh, you can see it declines um, more or less linearly with age until you reach this so-called threshold of disability, um, where it really means that you know, you'd be struggling to do any sort of reversal of the problem. Uh, and of course, this loss of muscle mass means that you end up with people that have, um, they have less protect, the bone is less protected by muscle, so that means that if they have a fall, they're more likely to break a bone than if, than if they had more muscle. Um, and you know, having a, having a bone broken in, in this sort of age group is a major, major issue. It probably changes the whole life completely and, and the dependence on, on people more. So it is a big issue. Um, the, the other thing which also happens is that not only does skeletal muscle mass decline <coughs> like that, actually muscle strength declines, the, the stars, whatever they are, uh, it actually declines at a slightly faster rate than muscle mass. So there's been a lot of interest in what, you know, what can we do to, to try and reduce the muscle loss. 
particularly in the elderly, can we do anything, you know, once people have reached this sort of region here? And a lot of the emphasis has been on protein. These are two studies. There's lots of them now. But these are two quite, quite good ones, if you like. Um, and really it shows that whey protein provides, of, of all the proteins people have looked at, whey protein seems to provide the greatest anabolic stimulus. You can see here compared, um, the, other, the other interesting thing is that quite a bit of the data so far has looked at the combination of resistance exercise with the protein being consumed in the recovery period, in other words, more or less immediately after the end of some resistance exercise. Um, Ollie, Willow, Ollie Wittard from the University of Stirling um, now tells me that in fact the window of opportunity is probably slightly longer. He reckons it's probably at least an hour after the exercise is finished. It may be even a bit longer than that, but, it, but nevertheless, the combination of resistance exercise and then consumption of protein in, in the period afterwards, whenever you want to do that, actually provides a much greater anabolic stimulus than either exercise or protein on their own. So you can see here the impact of exercise. In this was both whey protein and casein. And you can see in both cases, exercise actually improved <coughs> the rate of muscle a protein synthesis, but you can see that the whey protein actually was far uh, much a long way ahead of the impact of whey of casein. Interestingly, one of the things that I think Ollie, Ollie's looking at at the minute is one of the things that happens during the night <laughs> is that almost everybody overnight goes into negative muscle protein balance, if you like. And this is a particular problem in the elderly. And what they're looking at is the use of casein casein-based drink at bedtime, because casein has a much slower digested, digested rate than, than whey protein. And the, I can't remember how much they're using. It's quite a large dose of casein. And this actually mod moderates considerably the muscle, muscle loss during the night. So anyway, uh, the other thing just to notice is that when you compare whey protein with the vegetable protein, plant proteins, this is with, with soy protein, which actually tends to be one of the better ones. Uh, you can see the whey protein again. In, uh, actually, here there was a quite a linear dose response uh, of whey protein in relation to muscle, muscle, protein, muscle protein synthesis, whereas the, um, the, 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 the soy protein didn't really do much until you get to a much higher dose. And even then, it wasn't, any, it wasn't significantly, it was significantly poorer than the, than the whey protein. So there's a lot of interest in, um, if you like, there's a lot of companies that are very big in the whey protein stroke sports stroke muscle industry are now trying to see whether in fact they can widen their cons customer base to include the, the elderly as well. And, and you know, I think it, it, the, the evidence is pretty good and I think it probably needs to be exploited uh, a bit more than it has been. So that's it really, just a few conclusions. I think, you know, there are what I would call issues at all life stages. There are opportunities as well to do things at all life stages. Uh, I think milk substitutes and milk children shouldn't meet. But that's, you could argue about that, I know. Um, dairy products, despite being a major saturated fat source, are not really associated with increased cardiometabolic disease risk. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about the issue of butter. There's only really one meta-analysis on butter I'm aware of, which showed butter not really to be very risky either, but I think we need a bit more data on that, considering that we see these consistent cholesterol responses to butter when we don't see them from cheese. But I think, you know, predicting um, cardiovascular disease or cardiometabolic disease risk simply on the basis of dietary saturated fat intake is complex and I think can also mislead. It's not a straightforward relationship. I think the evidence for fermented dairy products, particularly yogurt and type 2 diabetes, I think it needs what I would call urgent attention, you know, given where we are with, with type 2 diabetes. I think the, the association between particularly processed meat and type 2 diabetes risk, I think it hasn't really had much attention. It certainly hasn't been publicized very much. The evidence base is probably not as great as for 
for other things, but it's, it's emerging, and I think you know, that needs to be, it needs a bit more attention about that. And I think overall, we actually need a clearer focus on not only different types of meat, but also different types of dairy products. You know, you can see from what we've seen, they do different things. And you still see a number, of, you still see studies published where dairy, dairy products are all classified as dairy products. Uh, and they're very, you know, they're very different. Um, apart from being different in fat content, as many of them are. So I'll leave you then with just a, some pictures of our five campuses. Um, only three of which I've ever been to. <laughs> but uh, they do exist. Thank you very much. <laughs>